Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of your Serving Those Who Serve conference. It's wonderful to see all these smiling faces today, and we look forward to our guest speaker, as well as the wonderful presentations we have downstairs. So for today, I am happy and ecstatic to introduce our, our master of ceremonies today, Ms. Heidi Audette. She is our communications director for your Washington State Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, she also likes to moonlight at Tacoma Comedy Club as well as the Circle K in Lacey. So if you ever want to see her, just stop by. Well, good morning. What an absolutely amazing day we had yesterday. I hope you had an opportunity to meet someone new, to learn something that inspired you, and to make a connection that mattered. That is really what this conference is all about. So a few reminders for today. Please complete your session surveys. QR codes are available on the packet printouts, and we really do use this information to help inform what we're going to do in future conferences. So take a couple minutes, let us know what you liked, what you didn't like, and maybe even what you might want to hear about next year. Lunch today is going to be on your own in Wenatchee, so the Chamber of Commerce has provided us with a list of restaurants in the area. You can access that list on the back of your packet. There's a little QR code that'll take you back to the Event Squid website, and you'll find the list there. So very excited to go get to try some of the local fare. We do have a schedule change for today. Session D2, Service Animals, is being replaced with a second session of Learn Saves Lives, and that will be presented by Brett Bass, the Forefront Suicide Prevention Program Manager. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Christine Robinson from Wenatchee American Legion Post 10, who will sing God Bless America. Please rise. While the storm clouds gather far across the sea, let us pledge allegiance to a land that's free. Let us all be grateful for a land so fair as we raise our voices in a solemn prayer. God bless America, land that we love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above, from the mountains, to the prairies, to the oceans, white with foam. God bless America, our home, sweet home. God bless America. Our home, sweet home. All right, please take your seats. So, thank you so much, Christine. That was absolutely beautiful. What a great way to start our day today. So this morning, we are going to do something just a little bit different than we have done in past years. Yesterday, we spent a lot of time learning new things, learning how we can better serve veterans and their families in our communities. Today, we're going to take a little bit of time and really focus on our own wellness. Our speaker is going to share a story of sheer will and determination, just the kind of motivation that we need to start day two here at Serving Those Who Served. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. His journey has taken him across the globe where he has achieved remarkable success and left a lasting impression on those he's worked with. 
As a Marine Corps veteran and fitness professional, Reuben Payan Jr.'s crowning achievement is conquering the seven summits of the world, a feat that required immense dedication, perseverance, and a strong mindset. Through this incredible endeavor, Reuben led, learned invaluable lessons about the importance of hard work, determination, discipline, and unwavering determination. Today, he continues to empower individuals to unleash their full potential, lead fulfilling lives, and pursue their dreams. Please join me in welcoming Reuben Payen, Jr. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? Check, check, check. Thank you, everyone for joining me this evening, or this, after, this morning. First of all, I'd like to thank all the staff for the Washington Department of Veterans Affairs. Can we give them a round of applause for all the hard work? Before I get started this morning, I'd like to play a video. Now, this video has not been shown. This is the first time publicly that it's been shown to anyone. I did a project a few years ago. They just finished the filming, and what they did is they traveled around the world and they tried to identify the characteristics of what it makes up a genius. And I was referred by a friend for the principle of devotion to goal. And so I'd like to share this five-minute video with you and introduce you to Genius, Genius Inc., We hit about 6,100 meters, getting ready to climb the yellow tower. I like doing things that, that most people will say are impossible. When I'm focused on something, I don't hear anything else, I don't feel anything else except what I'm dedicated to. In 2006, I joined a climb of Kilimanjaro. When I reached the top, I was hit with this blast of energy. I said, you know what, I don't want to just climb one, I want to climb them all, all the seven summits. The highest mountain on each continent. My name is Ruben Payan Jr. and I'm a climber. I would define the word goal similar to a lighthouse. If you're in the ocean, which is like life, and you see a lighthouse, it's something that you head for. It's a place of safety. Every day you should have a goal. Short term, mid term, long term, life goals. Feeling good. Making preparations for next year because it's gonna be some serious work. To hold myself accountable and to root myself into the journey, I went and tattooed the names of the mountains on my back and left the space for the date I reached each summit. Devotion means to me that no matter what happens, no matter who says you can't, there's nothing that should stop you. Nothing. After Kilimanjaro, I started climbing the next mountain. The idea of the seven summits came as a byproduct of me going through some hard times in my own personal life. It was a way for me to redeem myself. Each mountain was a symbol of, of me kind of letting go of that weight, that burden within me. All of those things, all that negativity can I be successful? Am I worthy? Am I good enough? Uh, each mountain that I conquered, I felt a little lighter and a little lighter and a little lighter. It's a steady grind and, and the elements are just beating you down. 
It feels like you're sucking air through a coffee straw. An avalanche has changed our plans. But yesterday was hella tough. Really hella tough. It's a test of patience, but you press on and press on because you just accept that this is just part of the experience of mountaineering. You have to be a risk taker. You have to know every time you're on the mountain that you might die. Embrace your imagination. Be fearless. And use that devotion as fuel to drive you forward. On Mount Everest, about 25 minutes before the summit, I went blind with dry eye syndrome. I felt really tired and I felt like quitting. I was not going to make it. It put me in a whole new space of humility and really looking at my life and saying, this is not just about me. I can't quit now. I was not moving very fast, but I would scream at the top of my lungs, I'm the most powerful human in the world. Pretty soon you, you realize that you're there, you're there at the summit. You can't really put words behind it, but you feel anything's possible. I started climbing in 2006 with the first mountain of Kilimanjaro. I finished in 2016, the South Pole, Mount Vincent. I have officially finished all seven summits. What genius means to me is awareness, consciousness, and understanding that your words and your emotions and your actions can change the world. So be patient with your goals. And don't be afraid to go and accomplish what you feel you need to be complete. Anything's possible. Anyone can become a genius. Thank you, thank you. All right. So if you guys don't mind, I'm going to walk around, get off the podium. I was invited here to talk about Mount Everest and my experience. And I wish that I could tell you that my experience on Mount Everest was a pleasant one. It was not. I wish that I can tell you that I kicked Mount Everest's ass, but I didn't. No, what I can honestly tell you about Mount Everest is that the, the Reuben that went up the mountain is not the same Reuben that came down. As my partner of 17 years would say, I'm happier, kinder, and much more fun to be around. Wouldn't you agree, babe? <laughs> Imagine this. We're at high camp, 8,300 meters. I'm lying in my tent. I just woke up from the short power nap. And I can see my my tent shaking. Now I happen to be a suspense, thriller, horror kind of movie guy. And I'm sitting in this tent and I'm like, man, that reminds me of that 1960 psycho movie. Remember the shower scene? Does anyone remember that? Yeah. It reminded me of that, of how vulnerable I was behind this little fabric tent. I remember thinking, Maybe Mother Nature is just kind of showing us and showing me who's really in charge up here. And it definitely wasn't me or my team. I sat back and I grabbed my down hoodie and I put it over my head and I just lied back. And I thought this would be a great opportunity for me to just kind of take it all in. I've been practicing this being in the moment for a long time. And I thought this could be a good opportunity to practice. So I lied back, I closed my eyes, I took a big deep breath in. They say the space of nirvana lies between the breath. I held it for a few seconds and I exhaled. It felt like this. And a flood of memories came over me. That Arizona tattoo parlor 
where I was getting those tattoos on my back. And the tattoo artist looking at me, and he's like, bro, you sure you want to do this? I said, yeah, I have to do this. It's the only way that I can beat that inner demon. I think we all have that voice inside of us that kind of holds us back. It was the only way. I said, if I don't etch these goals onto my back, I'm going to be a loser for the rest of my life. That was what I was thinking. And it was the only way that I can really hold myself accountable. Thank you. I can hold myself accountable to the goal. So I tattooed it. Now, mind you, people made fun of me. They said, you know, Ruben, you can always put a big butterfly over it. <laughs> if you'd like to, if you change your mind. No, I was determined. And I just was just kind of with those moments and with those memories. And I looked and I saw my Sherpa. And my Sherpa was making his special, we call it Sherpa porridge stew. And he had told me a few days prior that this was what gave him superhuman strength. So I was super, super excited. I'm like, I'm going to shove down two bowls of this. Now let me tell you a little bit about my shirt because he's a special guy. His name is Lakpa Golu, and he holds the record for the fastest ascent on Mount Everest. Guinness Book of World's record. 10 hours, 56 minutes, and 46 seconds. Freak. He's a freak. I met him few, uh, four years prior to uh, Everest. I met him in Aconcagua, and he was actually with another expedition team. And we happened to kind of, he knew our team members, and we were having a team dinner, and in, in, in conversation, he said, oh, I, I seasonally climb Everest. I, I have guides, and I send clients up, and I'm like, holy smokes, like, this is the guy that I need to climb Mount Everest with. If I'm going to go with anybody in the world, I'm going with who? The fastest guy. And so fast forward, I'm looking at him, I'm like, wow, life is kind of amazing how it puts everything together for you at this particular moment. So I finished up my two bowls. We packed up all of our gear. Now the climbers headed out of the tent. And we were getting ready for our first steps past High camp. Now, do I have any fellow Marines? <clears throat> I remember Locke was stepped up and he said, Get ready! And it reminded me of that staff sergeant that used to say on the firing range, Lock and load! It's kind of brought this energy over my body. And there we go. At 10, 10 30 at night, we were going to go past high camp, travel through the three steps, and make it to summit 5.30 to 6 in the morning. Now, prior to camp three, life wasn't so good for me. I was vomiting. I think I had lost like 20 pounds just vomiting. But it seemed like that day and that night, everything cleared. My body felt great. Lakwa said to me, we're going to be at the front, so you're going to have to move a little quicker. I was ready for the challenge. And there was no way that I was going to embarrass a super Sherpa. I was like Robin to Batman. And there we go. Boom. Everything was smooth. My body was just performing at the best. And then I noticed... Maybe about an hour and a half later, the climber in front of me started slowing down. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Because you have to maintain your distance. But he started slowing down. I'm like, oh, my God, please don't slow down, because if you do, there's going to be this traffic jam behind you. Well, he was navigating around a fallen climber that had passed years earlier. Such a moment. A raw moment. And I remember walking around this body. And I just stopped. I'm sure like all the other climbers, you're hitting the chest 
with life is real. It's real. And I thought to myself, what the hell happened to this guy? How did this happen? Did he have kids? Did he have a wife? And I said, you know, I hope that he died doing exactly what the hell he wanted to do. And that was conquering his Mount Everest. And for a moment, I felt this sense of compassion for this stranger. We had to move on. As we started moving up the mountain, the wind from my right flank started getting into my eyes. Now, mind you, it's the middle of the morning. I didn't have clear goggles. All I had was my tinted goggles. And if I were to put those on, it would have made my vision worse. So I grabbed my hoodie, and I kept marching, marching, marching. And Locke was moving. He's on my ass. Go, 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 go. And that wind just kept driving into me and driving into my right side. And it seemed like the more that I tried to moisten my eyes by naturally blinking, the worse it became. About 2.30 in the morning, I was praying to all the gods that the sun would come up and I can find refuge by putting on my tinted goggles. The fight continued. And the more we kept going, the more the wind blasted. And about 5.30 to 6 in the morning, I could see the snow starting to change the color. It started lightening up. Boy, was I happy. We took a little break, got inside my bag, pulled out my tinted goggles, expecting what? Expecting my eyesight to get a little better. It did not. I stopped for a moment, took them off, cleaned the lenses front and back because I thought, maybe it's the lenses. Put them back on, still the same. It was almost like I was looking through a frosty white mug. I could make out shades of color, but I couldn't make out distinct lines. So I thought, all right, I'll figure this out because I was kind of embarrassed. You know, I'm a Marine. I got some things I got to work through. I was kind of embarrassed. I'm like, okay. Water. I'll grab a Nalgene bottle, dip my fingers in the water, and try to moisten my eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, it made it worse. So worse that my eyes started to stick together. And then I knew I screwed up. Lockwood came over to me, and he's like, you ready to go? I said, how far away from Summit? He's like, oh, less than 30 minutes. Like, less than 30 minutes? That's like from here to the wall. That's how close it is. You know, we're talking 40 feet. That takes a little time to get there. So when he said less than 30 minutes, I'm thinking, wow, we're close. So I thought to myself, maybe we can just get to the top. We could figure this thing out. I was hoping... I was hoping he wasn't going to turn around. Because if I were destined to die on Mount Everest, in my mind, I would have rather have gotten to the summit, get the freaking picture, let everybody know that I made it, give him my camera, and then when he comes down, everybody around will like, such a hero. <laughs> Instead, you turn around, 20 minutes from the summit, you die on the way back, My family says, hey, did he make it? He's like, no, he made it 20 minutes from the top. And I die feeling utterly disappointed. (laughs) Lakpa said, let's get to the top. Woo, okay. At least I made it. That's good. So he carries me, he gets close to me. I remember kind of dragging me up to the top. And he sits me down. Let me show you a picture here. Somebody snapped that at the summit. That's me off to the right. That's Lockbaugh off to the left. I'm reaching in to grab my camera. Or, excuse me, I'm reaching in to grab my camera. 
and I gave him my camera, and I said, Lockwood, snap the picture, but keep the camera. You know why, right? I knew he would make it back down. I wasn't so sure I was going to make it back down. I said, keep the camera and give it back to me when we get back to high camp. Fingers crossed. He agreed. I pulled out my banner, took the picture. I'm actually blind in this photo. When I pulled out the banner and, and said, hey, Lachman, make sure it's straight. It might be upside down. So this picture, ladies and gentlemen, is me being blind on the top of the world. I wrapped the banner, put it back in my down suit, and I can hear other climbers coming up because when you go to Everest, you got the north side and you got the south side. So there were south side climbers coming up. And they were cheering and laughing and joking and like trying to give me hugs. I'm like, oh. I was really pissed. I said, this should be my time to celebrate. What the hell did I do wrong, God? That I get this moment of glory stolen away from me. I was quite upset. A few profanities at the summit, unfortunately, but it happens. I was humiliated. I have, up to that point, I had a pretty big ego. Tough guy, machine gunner. I had a lot of things to prove in my life, but at that moment, I'm like, okay, how the heck am I going to get down? Now, I knew Lakba, but I didn't really know Lakba, if you understand what I mean. If it were my Marine, machine gunners, I'm coming down. Ura. They're bringing me down. This guy wasn't a Marine. I knew him, but I didn't really know him. And I'm thinking to myself, what if this guy leaves me up here? I'm going to be the main attraction for all climbers. Look at the orange guy when you get to the summit. And everybody's going to take, everybody's going to freaking take pictures of me. I didn't want to be that guy. So I'm thinking to myself, is he going to leave? Is he going to stay? Is he going to leave? Is he going to stay? And I pose the question to you. What would you do? Would you try to bring me down? A solo rescue from the top of the world? Or would you say, you know what, that's too risky. I can't take the chance. I have my family. I have my children. I have my job, I have my life, and this guy that I don't really know, that's probably a lot heavier than me, if he falls, I fall too. What would you do? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just standing with you. So you know, there's a part of this experience that I don't remember. And I hadn't seen him for 10 years. Since we climbed, I hadn't seen him. Yesterday was the first time that I invited him out. I wanted to surprise everybody. And I invited him out to come and give his side of the story. Because I didn't know what happened. There's a period of time when I don't remember. So... Lakwa, all you, my friend, thank you. I love you. I love you. All right, guys, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone.
I think the testing. Test it. Test. Good morning, everyone. I was a little shocked with this telling, or Ruben telling about little, our history. I'm adding a little bit more history about the, he adding more, most of the histories went up, getting on the summit top. How to get down now? More challenge in the mountaineering and climbing, uh, dangers and more challenge is uh, coming down, descending. 99% people uh, on the mountain accident after summit. Why? Because uh, people just thinking about only the summit, pushing the summit. They want to use all energy, all oxygen, everything's used on the gate on the summit. They didn't think about it going down. They don't. And that was uh, Oh. We uh, most I, I would I would say uh, everyone's climbing or hiking, uh, like a swimming in the ocean, you have to have thinking about a turn around. How many energy you have to need the bag? You you swimming the ocean far away. You use all uh, energy way up there. Get there. How far is? And you have to back energy, same energy, maybe more energy you have to back. Same as uh, mountaineering, uh, same. You need to, I would say all my, I'm submitted every 15 times. I've been on uh, every expedition 19 times, but 15 summit. And my experience is uh, you have to have energy, uh, more than 50% save your energy way down. So far, 99% um, people are uh, accident on the mountains after summit. And why? They, they are just all use oxygen up and energy up, and then they don't energy after summit. They are so exciting and taking pictures, sitting there a long time. They didn't follow up the timing, get down. And then up in the, when you get to summit, and then, and then and after summit, when are climbing, you're not gonna get trip, right? And just you stay by it slowly, and then coming down, you guys a little trip, and one time fell down, you lost 20% uh, energy, and second times fall down, you lost 20%, uh, uh, 40% energy, you lost it two times fall down on mountain coming down, and then after that. You are nervous, and you are shocked, and you some heading somewhere in the rock, your knee or whatever, your body, and he's somewhere. And then you lost lots of energy. Two times fell down, you lost 40 percent energy way down. And then after that, uh, then also uh, there are oxygen, even the oxygen. People use oxygen, all oxygen went up. They didn't feel, follow the oxygen need to come down. You have to have 75% uh, oxygen you have to save down. And, and also there's, I have a list more tape in, uh, about the oxygen, using the oxygen and mountaineering, if anybody wants to in the future climbing. Save your oxygen. There's a uh, mountaineering, the oxygen uh, regulator says there's a the maximum is a four pressure, one, two, three, four. I use, I usually let them use, and for my clients, uh, um, 1.5 post beginning, one. And how is he doing good or not? Everybody doing good? Keep in um, uh, pressure one. Or if he's not doing very well, just turn on a little bit more and a point five. 1.5, and he's, he's not doing very well again, and it turned on uh, pressure two, no more than pressure two. And then because uh, there's a pressure four, we use already two, there's left two point. 
to pressure and there's the emergency there's the medical emergency oxygen that's my experience and then if there's something's happen and some problem you fell down break your leg something like that and you 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 lose your energy and you can turn on pressure three you will you feel better better and then then if not then you need to move and you turn on full pressure number four you will feel like a when you are 8,000 meters, if you feel you are no, your elevation 8,000 meters, when you turn on a poor pressure, you will be there down there, 6,000 feet, 6,000 meters. Feel you feel that there was uh, oxygen uh, pressure up and down, turn up and down. That's really important. Do not use. Some people does. I, I want to use a poor pressure. Already that all poor pressure. When uh, there's no emergency oxygen left, and there was uh, lots of people uh, accident that kind of situation, and yeah, this uh, this guys we uh, Ruben and I climbed together 2013, which is he explained most of the all history and went up like a Sherpa oatmeal. Sherpa Paris, which is a uh, um, roasted uh, barley flour, roasted barley flour. It's a, use a little bit of tang juice, tang juice with the water, and mix it and drink it. Very, that's very you know, the mountain. You can eat. That's you know very hard to eat, and you know we eat that, and then that's very helpful. And then he want to eat. It. And they, I, you have to, you have to eat, you have to drink it, and he, he drink it, and yeah, that. And then we went to the summit. We are uh, just two of us, and there's other people uh, was on the summit days, and the some some uh, Chinese group they already summit. They already morning they left, and then the summit had to come down, and then. Uh, Ruben and I was a uh, second group, and then Byron, we went there. He doing very good. When we went up, uh, he was uh, he was really really pay attention what I'm saying. For him, hey, do this, do this. He he's follow me what I'm saying him. Every I was proud, and then we climbing every step. He followed my step. He not gonna go anywhere. And then he do that, but very close by summit, rope distance like a 30, 35 feet, wall to here. Summit is just right there, but takes long. Looks very close, but five feet takes long. 10 feet takes long. And he was a, I was prone. He, I look at the behind, he's, he's, he's not going my step. He's going like that, somewhere other way, and he walked like that. I'm this way. He's going this way. Hey, Ruben, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? And he says, Lakpa, I can't see it. What? I can't see, man. I can't see it. And then what happened? And I come back and then look at it, sitting down, sitting him down, and then what happened? And I can't see it, man. I can see it. How far is the summit? Takes another 25, 30 minutes, just right there. I can see Lakpa, I can see it. And oh my gosh, what can I do? There's nothing in our support, just he and myself. Oh my goodness. This is a huge problem now. And then the summit is just right there. And then, okay, I'm thinking, oh, I can't turn around there, so just a rope distance. 35, 30 feet. I can't turn around. Let go. Let's go summit. I grab him, him his leg, hand like that. Let's go summit. <laughs> Drag him like that. And then on, on the summit, I sit him on the foot of the summit. Stay here. Give me camera. I was, uh, I was shocked. I was over it. And then give me camera. And then he pulled the camera. And I took a picture. And then he pulled in again his banner. His banner is a, like a frozen desert. Very difficult to, uh, this 
banners are rolling up and then just you know, frozen and then get the flat there. Oh my goodness, and make the flat banner and then let him holding holding your banner. I, I took only the, his personal pictures. Let's go down. And he says, <laughs> he says, oh, I, my banner, my banner. Oh my gosh, Rubin, come on. <laughs> What's your banner? Is in my backpack, backpack, backpack. I, oh my gosh, that's, and I put in his backpack, open backpack, and then and pull his banner, which is a human, this banner here, look at that. Powerful human love banner. Pull it up and then hold it up and then you take pictures. And then, by the way, there are times there's other, uh, south, we are north side, there's a south side, there's a people came to the summit, and we met some people on the summit, and some people still coming up the south side. I was thinking, this, this is blind people now. How do I, I can't, these guys, I can't take north side. North side is way difficult than coming down. And south side is a little easier than coming down. We rescue down the people much easier because it's steep. And then if you, uh, up to South Summit, and there's a little difficult, but uh, after South Summit, there's a, there's, I'm telling the South side. And south, from the South Summit to the South Pole, pretty slope down. And then if something happened, you put in your backpack on your butt, you, you can slide down, the, on the, down, get to the camp. And the North side, you have to have some point, when coming down, you have to climb up. You have to have all the way Hiking, you have to have a walk. And then, oh my God, I thought, I'm thinking, I might take these guys from going down the south side, dam care in the China side. But I was worried about that we have a visa in China. Our passport, everything's in the, in the best skin. If we came to the Nepal side, we got a problem. We issue the visa, you know, and then, then, oh no. It, Go in the China side. What happened? What is that? And if if everything's but and and don't care. And then let's go down. And then I bring him down. And then there, there's other some of my uh, like my our little related uh, other climber, the Sherpa people, Sherpa here two Sherpa and one clients. They came up and we came down. We met him. Uh, below the summit somewhere, and then uh, they went up summit, and we came down. And the, we came down, and then below the summit, there's a, a, one of the rock spots, are pretty difficult, and then I bring him down, so difficult to pass that rock spot, and always a rock spot, but pass, pass that on the top, below there, difficult, and then I try to him, bring him down, and then that, that Times are uh, just long, and then the other guys are in summit and come back, and we meet him there. And then they are trying to a little bit help, but um, came down a little bit, come together, a couple feet, but after that, they just left us, and then they went down. And then, then uh, take his client, their clients, and take care, they have two shirts, one client, they went down. And after that, just Ruben and myself, that's on the mountain, nobody up there. And then, oh my gosh, this is so, I was, oh my gosh. And came down, there's a hillary in the, above the second steep, there's a north side, the first steep, very steep there, and the second steep, there's a ladder on there, ladder. We put the ladder, two, two is part of the ladder, top one and bottom one. This top one is a long ladder, 10 feet ladders on, on body all straight up, and below one is the, there's a little uh, uh, shorter one, but there's a very difficult to step on the, on the slippery rock, and there's a, we put in a rock uh, ladder in there. We came past through that ladder, Rubin's uh, both legs, the stuck in the, in the ladder, between the ladder, the hole in the hole, he goes, both legs go through in there. He stuck there. Oh my gosh, that's so he can't come back. Oh my gosh. We I took that uh, more than one hour. I took him from the ladder. And I there's a, we, I can't he can't come up. 
He stuck there. Oh my gosh. And then I, I took him crampons. Took him his crampons. And then I was uh, going underneath the ladder. And then I pushed his head is here and then pushing back from the ladder. And then and finally he his legs came out in the ladder. And then then bring him down the bottom of the ladder and then put back in the crampons again. It's a lot of work because there's a note right here. Low altitude, there's a high altitude, there's a 8,600 feet. Really, really difficult to walk, to climb on foot and back. It's cold. There's a, with a big glove, big mountain glove. You can walk, you have to take out your glove. And without a glove, you have to fit his crampons on the boot and check out and put back. And it takes more than hours there in the ladder. And after this, from there to the between second step, first step, all this part is a very slope, very slope in all rock. There's no snow. And there's really, that was the hardest part in the, bringing him down. And I don't have a, not any choice, and I grab his leg. Hey, grab one leg and then put in the step there. Don't move. He says, okay, okay. And then I grab another leg up, sitting there. Don't move. And he says, okay. He was, he was really, really uh, pay attention. He's, uh, when I move his leg, he was uh, uh, holding on a rock like that, and then he was like that. I, I, I put him like that, and he's he, he not going to move. He was really, really secret like that on a rock. He's, that's why I like him. That always I like him, you know. He's a really pay attention. What I'm saying, if he didn't do that, uh, there's a, if he fell down, I'm gone. If I'm gone, he's gone. There's a rope, it's really, really thin rope. Because uh, summit day, there's a thick rope, is a, uh, we can put, but there's a very heavy, people cannot, there's only one day for rope that people, you can put the rope, thin rope. There's a very thin, small rope, rope there. If this guy's uh, body's weight is uh, almost twice than me, and then he's fell down, I'm gone, I'm nothing there, right? And then the rope's not gonna uh, hold two people. The, the rocks, the cart, the ropes, we're gone. And <clears throat> yeah, in, uh, is that, uh, if it uh, was that uh, other people, not me, if with him, with the other people, they're not going to make it the rescue like that down. One people, that kind of altitude, nobody can rescue him down. If there's other people there with him, definitely 100 percent they left in the mountain there. Thank you. There's no chance to bring down. I, 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 I take my huge risk myself and my family. And then, but anyway, you guys blessed us and we saved our life. Thank you. And my family, I say thank you, my family, you guys, and all your uh, Rubin family. They bless us and then we saving life and coming down. And when we get in the uh, hiking, and they're close by the hiking, uh, my relatives uh, who is a uh, summit going down, they, his, uh, they came. Get the, make some tea and coffee and then bring off him the little up of a hike him. One way I met that and then I'm so happy and then when I get the rich in the hike him, I'm so happy. This I'm now I'm so right. Because of so hike him, there's a lots of people. This is my friend and lots of climbers there. And then he's blind, he's I putting him in my tent in our tents, sitting down and then so, um, he was calling to Kemi, 
in the Beijing. His his phone is working in the cell phone is working in the uh, eight eight thousand three hundred meters. Well, I'm so I'm so surprised. Ruben is like, just he's lying down in the tent. He's calling. I'm trying to find out the uh, eye drop. In the, in the high game, but well, there's he's a land and he calling. Hey, Ruben, what are you calling? I'm he's calling making this phone. sound way worse than what it was. What? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a part of this story that he didn't really fully remember because he was so focused on me that when I, we talked about it yesterday, he's like, really? But I remember. So after we finished coming down from second step, I was exhausted. I mean, like, really exhausted. And I had read about this when your mind starts playing these games with you. Which starts talking to you about, hey, I think it's about time. Why don't you find that nice, quiet place and just go to sleep? I remember that feeling of, and I asked him, Lakpa, how much longer? And you know it's a long time, it's a long distance away when he says, don't worry about it. It was like that one beacon of hope. <laughs> Maybe we're close. And what happened is, is there happened to be another climber going up. His name was Ro uh, Rupert, and he was an Australian climber. We had met him at advanced base camp maybe three weeks prior. And he was doing a solo climb, no supplemental oxygen, unassisted, and he was on his way up. He already came up, uh, when we came down, we met him uh, above a second step of the ladder. How did he make it up there? And then, and so that's surprisingly, without oxygen. And then he asking me, we are coming down, he asking me, how far is the summit? He, he, even he didn't know us, right? And then he, he thought of someone else. And then, how far is the summit, man? If you at this kind of pace, you're going to be another five, six hours. Really? Wow. Looks there, man. Looks there. He says, yeah, yeah, it is, looks just pretty close there, but it takes a while. This is mountain. <laughs> this, is a, this is a mountain and Everest. It's pretty close there, yeah. And then, so I hear them talking. What am I do? <laughs> and then he says, uh, better to turn around. If you, wanna, if you have a family... <laughs> Dad and mom, family, friends, turn around. And they're having this way, turn around. They're you know, having this conversation. And I'm thinking to myself, I just want to take a nap. I hear them having this conversation, and then Ru I hear these footsteps. And Rupert said, Reuben, what are you doing? I said, I'm blind. I can't, I'm not doing anything but sitting there. And Lakwa asked him, would you turn around and help me bring him down? Now, I don't know who saved whose ass. Maybe we save Rupert, because if he would have gone up, he would have passed away on the way down. But he made the decision to turn around and tie in and help bring me back to high camp. And I, someone happened to catch a video of it. Did you? There's a video. Yep, that's the video. Someone caught about a minute. Rupert's here on my left side. I'm in the middle, and Lakba's just below me. No worries. No worries. We don't need to show that. <laughs> they see it. They know how bad it looks. But it was interesting. Rupert tied in behind me. Locke was in front of me. And I just closed my eyes. 
because I'm trying to conserve as much energy as possible and keeping my eyelids open just took too much energy. So I just closed my eyes. I tried to him, uh, his eyes, uh, he, he couldn't see it, but I let him to put in your goggles on there, he getting warm, he stay warm when you put the goggles on. His goggles is uh, not in here, his goggles. <laughs> Can you save me a little bit of pride here? <laughs> oh my God. Okay, have a seat. The time's over. So it, it was the second wave of. Most people, most people are coming down the uh, goggles of fog up. There's a. I'm never inviting you again. <laughs> Never. Put back. He don't worry about. It. He don't need to worry about the goggles clean and whatever. He's just goggles like that. Sometimes come down like that. He don't worry about <laughs> goggles clean and refresh. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Are you done? Yeah. Have a seat. Lafa. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. I didn't expect that to go that bad. <laughs> Thank you, Lachlan. I appreciate you being here. So after Rupert tied into me, as you can see, it was really bad. Another wave of this mental kind of, let's check out, kind of came in. And I share this part of, uh, part of the story. Prior to this climb, I never really rocked with Jesus. And what that means is, I, you know, I was raised Catholic, but I always kind of ran in the middle. But there was a time when I was coming down where it got really bad. And these guys don't really know because they're just trying to keep me up. But there got to a point where I just wanted to tell these guys to leave for a few reasons. The first reason is I felt so fucking guilty. I felt so guilty that I was doing this to those two men. The second thing is, is and I get really choked up about this because it's so, so heartfelt to me. I got a chance to experience unconditional love. Two men... However it happened, whether Rupert was going to go up, whether he was going to come down, however it happened, I got a chance to experience what I put on that banner. And on the way down, this voice said, say it. My yell was, was getting ready to tell them just to put me down. I want to go to sleep. And this voice came in and said, say it. Now, like I said, I don't know if it was God, or I don't know if it was my mind and its last-ditch effort to save my own ass. Whatever it was, this is what I heard, so I'm going to share it. This voice said to me, say it. The body of Christ empowers me. That's what I heard. I had never said it before. I had never heard it before. But the voice that said to me, say it, I said, what? Say what? The body of Christ empowers me. The body of Christ empowers me. And I said that mantra all the way until I got back down to high camp. And every time I would say it, it invigorated me. It brought life to me. And it gave me that power for that next step. And like I said, prior to this climb, I never really rocked with Jesus. But after this climb, we're pretty close. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for allowing Lakba and myself and my family to share our story with you. Have a wonderful time, and may God bless all of you. Thank you very much.
No pictures with Lakba, please. Ruben, um, that's an amazing story. So I'm just going to say a few words. For those of us that are in the military, uh, recognize things that when we do things of excellence, we hand out and exchange coins. So I'd like to give Ruben and Lak is Lakpa. If you wouldn't mind coming back up here, please. Because um, I know for us that served in the military, we talk about battle buddies. And obviously this story is an amazing story to see because you may, may not have been here. But because of this man and the other gentleman that's there and the stories that you share and the moments that we all talk about is never leave a man behind. Um, it's an amazing story. So this is a great way to start a morning, right? That inspirational, how you feel. And I just want to take a moment and just say thank you. On, on behalf of our organization, State of Washington, all the veterans that are here and everybody that heard the story, it's an amazing. So thank you. Obviously, you can hear me. Just talking about this is it's impactful. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, thank you. some gifts from Path with Arts. Thank you. I just wanted to extend the opportunity. If anyone has any questions? Anyone has any questions for myself? I want to extend the opportunity and ask. If there's no questions, maybe we look worse. <laughs> yes, sir. Living in, I moved to Beijing in 2007. Not another story. But I, I just moved back to the States about three years ago. And so I was actually doing my training in Beijing. And so, yes, it took me about 12 months of training. Yes, sir. Great question. So, when we arrived back to Camp 3, he went to go find some eye moisturizer, eye solution. I lied back. I had to make a call for Cami, so I checked my phone, kind of fumbled with it, made the call. What time was it, babe? It was 10 o'clock at night. I said, things aren't good. We need a helicopter. <laughs> my, poor, my, poor, my poor Cami, she, she calls her parents up. Here in Wenatchee, do you know anybody? Do you know anybody that can get them down from the north side of, of Mount Everest? And so they were working throughout the night to try to get me home. <laughs> and so when he came back, he put the solution in my eyes. I passed out about five hours later. I could see just a little better. I'm like, okay, maybe it's just a little bit more solution, a little bit more time, and yeah, my eyesight came back. When he laying down the tent, and the, he, he gave me the pawn, how about find out how, uh, Kami's uh, name here? And then I find out, give him his uh, dial the pawn. I thought he's just joking, right? And then his pawn is ringing there. Oh my gosh, this is a good idea. Yeah, this. <laughs> and then, yeah, and I was uh, find out that I mm, drops, and then my friends has, a, someone my friends has a pawn. I got an eye drop and I put in the eye drop and then uh, pretty much uh, early morning, 4 or 5 a.m. There's a, he says, Lakpa, we are the same time. Lakpa, Lakpa, yes. And I, I, I saw a little bit, see a little bit. Oh, I'm so happy. And because I, I'm not worried about that time, but if he's still blind, I call already Chinese uh, teams in the, in the ABC best game. They, I already called them and then they're trying to send a rescue from their uh, uh, last game. Which is, we already came there, I'm not worried about that. After that, I have lots of supporter, and I might, uh, there's a rescue, I can find them. And after that, after get in the high game, I'm 
we went up the six hours, climbed six hours, get down him 14 hours. Get down to uh, summit to the last game, 14 hours. Go ahead. Are you going, are you going to write a book? Please. We were just talking about that this morning. Please do, because that is the, one of the most amazing stories I've heard ever. When it goes into print and people realize how weak and vulnerable I was, <laughs> you know, it's like the internet. It lives on forever. But we're thinking about it. I still have Thank to you. do some growing internally. <laughs> Next question. What's the secret porch? You were just like... You were pumping it, pumping that porridge up. The secret, the secret stripper, stripper porridge. Remember, you were said, "Oh, you have to have my porridge." It's the. Stripper <laughs> porridge. That is the um, roasted dry barley flour. We call it sampa. Yes, really, really good for attitude on you. And that's a um, roasted, and we mail in the put in the mail and then the make a flour, and then barley, and then that's very helpful on the one you're going to high altitude. You eat that and this makes a little help for the altitude sickness as well. That's when you eat that champa champa. Something the most of the people use that in mountaineering. The uh, headaches go away. That's um, yeah. Have you kept in contact with Rupert? I reached out to Rupert about two weeks ago. We were just email. I thought I could get him to do a video, um, but I haven't spoken to him. Interesting story, though. About four years later, he sends me a picture. Guess what he sent me a picture of? The summit. The summit. <laughs> so his dream, his dream was fulfilled. I was, ha I was happy about it. I felt so guilty. But, you know, maybe we saved him. There was no one else that was going to tell him to turn around. And maybe for some reason, that's the way life works. People cross paths in the, in the sky. We saved each other. Now that you've done the seven summits, what did you do after that? I really want to know what's after that. <laughs> you know, after I came back from the seven summits, I'll tell you what, it was kind of depressing because you... You go through this, I have a goal, I have a goal, I have a goal, I have a goal, and then it, it happens, and then you come back, and like, you know what? I don't have to do anything else big. I could just be with myself and be a good partner and be a good dad and just enjoy my life. I tell everybody it was the most expensive personal development program I ever put myself in. <laughs> Have you guys ever heard that expression, the longest journey you'll ever travel is the 18 inches between your head and your heart? That's all I needed. <laughs> Next question. Yes. I have a question for you, Lapa. In the military, we are trained to never leave a fallen soldier and to bring each other down and to carry each other. Um, and we're, that's like hammered into us. And it's, I didn't hear you. Sorry about that. Oh. I was wondering, um, in the military, we're really trained to carry each other and to never leave a fallen comrade. And we're trained that since we're very young adults, and it's part of who we are and are the fabric of our character. What inspired you and what forged you into the type of person that you are where you would take such a risk for someone that you didn't really know and do such a phenomenal thing? That's the, my karma. <laughs> safe, safe, that's the big karma is a safe people life. I, yeah, I climbed Everest, uh, my 19 expedition, I never left people behind me. And then that's my karma. I don't want to leave people behind me. Get together all, together, much you can. Last time you climbed Everest. 
there's the Ruben and I come, there's a 2013 that I, there's my, after that, I was, uh, my summit uh, number is 15. There's a, most of summit uh, number was uh, 17. Only five, one guys, only five times more than me. I'm trying to catch up his record. But after we had that problem, I quit as Everest as <laughs> First of all, thank you so much for your inspiring uh, story. Uh, and uh, my question is uh, for either one of you, is, is the same route going up and then is it the same route coming down and, and is there a, uh, a backup route to come down if that one's too dangerous? North side? Yeah, there's a one, 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 up, one up road. So you have to come down same, same road. If you're missing the road, you lost. There's a, there's a 1996 history of the um, Scott Fisher. You guys heard about the Scott Fisher. He's from the Seattle, I think Washington, right? 1996. His body is still up there. They went up summit to the really, really late. And they summited at 4 p.m., something like that. And they're coming down. The weather is really bad, get back weather. And then the big storm, and then they're uh, above the, they are south side. But above a south coast, there's a big, like a, there's a no, you can't, you can't go anyway, but there's, uh, if there's, you, if you not uh, follow the peace road, if you go somewhere and then you lost there. And there was a uh, Scott Fisher, they are, uh, come down, they couldn't find that they, maybe ropes, uh, it's no bearing, uh, it's no, they couldn't find the rope. And then they, they go split somewhere, and then it's got pressure, it's still uh, bodies up there. That's the 1996, everybody's everywhere, people. And there's uh, one of the Russian guys, uh, Anatoly. He's, uh, he rescued to the South Pole. There's six people rescue his, himself in the South Pole. He's going to the other side. South Pole is a huge flat in the South Side. There's uh, like an airport in the South Side. In the South Pole is the last game. The, he went to the, he hearing some ways, uh, um, people crying, and he went there and grabbed them and put in his stand, and then he, and then other side somewhere, and then people crying there, and then he went there and grabbed some, and he saved six people alive in the South Pole. That's Anatoly. He's from Russia. And then 1996, and that, that was a, uh, and the north side, there's no, no way to go. There's a, we all put in a piece of rope there, but very thin, tiny ropes there. And then that's just only like, if you fell, that's just a little bit. But if you, something's happened going down, there's going to be rope caught in the rock. And then that's not safe. But, you know. More questions? All right, we're going to have one more question. I think Tony's got it over here. So my question for you is, when you realized that you were becoming blind and during this event that you had prepared for, for years, realistically, mentally, physically preparing for, and you couldn't experience it with all five of your senses, you couldn't see it happening, you're only experiencing it through the pictures that other people took for you, did you experience bitterness? And if so, how did you overcome that bitterness? The bitterness. Can you hear me? The bitterness happened when I was at the summit. Boy, I was I was really pissed. I figured this is the closest I can get to God physically, so He's right up there. So I was upset. Like I had a serious conversation. I'm like, I don't see the silver lining here. At the same time, people were like, "Cheers!" I'm like, it's kind of like everyone's having a good uh, good time at your birthday party except you. So I was really upset when I got to the summit. But that's how life is. Sometimes what you go into wanting to learn and what you come out of the experience learning are two totally different things. And in retrospect, when I look back, if you're really going to go and climb the highest mountain in the world and carry a banner that says powerful human love, and powerful human to me symbolizes that inner spirit within you, who you are as a person, not what you have or 
not what you accomplished, but who you are as, a, as your character. That's what a powerful human to me symbolizes. So if you're going to carry a banner that says powerful human love, by all means, someone's, <laughs> someone's going to show you what that is. So thank you all for allowing us to have this extended time, and God bless all of you. Thank you. Don't ask him a summit deal. <laughs> Interesting story. If you want to see how beautiful the view was, look through my goggles on the summit picture. Thank you all. Have a good morning. Hey, where's Tony? Can we give Tony Sandoval a, a round of applause? He was, he was the voice. He was the catalyst that made the recommendation for me to be here. And so thank you, Tony. I love you. It's my honor, brother. Thank you, brother. Ruben is going to stick around up here for a bit. You got more questions? He wants to answer them. Uh, it's a great human being. Thank you. And we'll be up here if you want to take a picture with Lachlan and I. You're more than help. help. Thank you. All right, everyone. So we we are going to get started with our sessions downstairs. Just a little bit late, so 9:45. Um, the two powerful powerful humans are going to be up here to answer some more questions. Thank you so much.